Alphonse, this is uh, Jay, I hope you're okay, it's good to be with you. Uh, we're just going through the uh, Evolution Cruncher book and we're in chapter 2. And uh, it, they give you free access to the book and you can use it, download it, put various information on, uh, they're happy to use it. Um, so it's called the Evolution Cruncher and we're in chapter 2. It says, look about you, there are clouds, seas and mountains, grass carpets, the plains and birds sing in the trees, farm animals uh, graze in the meadows, and water brooks run through the fields. In city and country, people use their astounding minds to plan and produce intricate things. At night, the stars come out, and overhead are billions of stars, and our galaxies beyond them are 100 billion island universes, each with 100 billion stars. Yet all of these things are made of matter and energy. Where did it all come from? How did everything begin? All the wonderful things of life and nature. Evolutionary scientists tell us that it all came from nothing. Yes, nothing. That is what being taught to your friends, children and loved ones. You need to know the facts. In this chapter we shall briefly view what evolutionary scientists teach about the origin of matter, stars, galaxies, planets and we will give you the basic scientific reasons why their cosmological theories are incorrect. Cosmology is the word used for theories about the origin of matter and stellar objects. The Big, Thang, Big Bang Theory has been accepted by a majority of scientists today. It theorized that a large quantity of nothing decided to pack tightly together and then explode outward to hydrogen and helium. This gas is said to have flowed outward through frictionless space, frictionless so that outflowing gas cannot stop or slow down to eventually form stars, galaxies and plants and moons. It all sounds so simple just as you would find in it a science fiction novel. And this is, and that is all it is. The originators, Joy, George Lameter, a Belgian struck on the basic idea in 1927 and George Gamal, R.A. Alpha and R.A. Herman devised the basic Big Bang model in 1948. But it was Gamal, a well-known scientist and science fiction writer that gave it present name and then popularized it. Isaac Asimov and Asimov's New Guide to Science in 1984, page 43, campaigning for the idea enthusiastically, he was able to convince many of the scientists he used quaint little cartoons to emphasize the details. The cartoons really helped sell the theory. The theory according to this theory in the beginning there was no matter, just nothingness, then this nothingness condensed by gravity into a single tiny spot and it decided to explode. That explosion produced protons, neutrons and electrons which flowed outward in incredible speed and throughout empty space but there was no other matter in the universe. As these protons, neutrons and electrons hurl themselves outward at supersonic speed, they are said to have formed themselves into typical atomic structures of mutually orbiting hydrogen and helium atoms. Gradually, the outward racing atoms are said to have begun circling one another, producing gas clouds which then push together into stars. These first stars only contain lighter elements, hydrogen and helium, then all of the stars repeatedly exploded. It took at least two explosions of each star to produce our elements. Gamma described it in the scientific terms in violation of physical law. Emptiness fled from the vacuum of space and rushed into a super dense core that had a density of 1094GM-CM2 and a temperature in excess of 1039 degrees absolute. That is a lot of density and heat for a gigantic pile of nothingness, especially when we realize that it's impossible for nothing to get hot. Although air gets hot, air is matter, not an absence of it. Where did this super dense core come from? Gamma solemnly came up with a scientific answer for this. He said it came as a result of the big squeeze. When the emptiness made up its mind to crowd together, then with true scientific aplomb, he named this solid core of nothing, Yalem, pronounced helium, helium. With a name like that, many people thought this must be a great scientific truth of some kind. In addition, numbers were provided to add an additional scientific flair. 
This remarkable lack of anything was said by Gamma to have a density of 10 to the 145 power g dash cc or 100 trillion times the density of water. Then all that packed into blanket blankness went boom. Let's take it point by point. That is the theory. It all sounds simple, just as you would find in a science fiction novel. And that is it. The theory stands in clear violation of physical laws, celestial mechanics and common sense. Here are a number of scientific reasons why the Big Bang Theory is unworkable and fallacious. Number one, the Big Bang Theory is based on theoretical extremes. It may look good in math, calcula math calculation, but it can actually happen. A tiny bit of nothing packed so tightly together that it blew up and produced all the matter in the universe. Seriously now, this is a fairy tale. It is a bunch of armchair calculations and nothing else. It is easy to theorize on paper. Big Bang is a theoretical extreme, just as is a black hole. It is easy to theorize that something is true when it has never been seen and there is no definite evidence that it exists or ever happened. But let us not mistake Disneyland theories for science. Nothingness cannot pack together. It would have now no way to push itself into a pile. Two, a vacuum has no density. It is said that nothingness got very dense and that it is why it exploded. But a total vacuum is the opposite of total density. There would be no ignition to explode nothingness, no fire, no match. It could not be a chemical explosion, for no chemicals existed. It could not be a nuclear explosion, for there are no atoms. There is no way to expand it. How can you expand what isn't there? Even that, even that magical vacuum could somehow be pulled together by gravity. What would then cause the pile of emptiness to push outward? The gravity which brought it together would keep expanding. Six, nothingness cannot produce heat. The intense heat caused by the exploding nothingness is said to have changed the nothingness into protons, neutrons and electrons. First, an empty vacuum in the extreme cold of outer space cannot get hot by itself. Second, an empty void cannot magically change itself into matter. Third, there cannot be heat without energy source. Seven, the calculations are too exacting. Too perfect an explosion will be required. One man, one, on many points, the theoretical mathematical calculations need to turn a Big Bang into stars and our planets cannot be worked out in, other, in others they are too exacting. Knowledgeable scientists call them too perfect. Mathematical limitations would have to be met, which would be net in, next to impossible to achieve. The limits for success are simply too narrow. Most aspects of the theory are impossible, and some require parameters that would require miracles to fulfill. One example of this is the expansion of the original fireball from the Big Bang, which they place precisely within the narrowest limits. An evolution astronomer, R. H. Nick, says, Dyke, or Dick, says it well. If the fireball had expanded only 1% faster, the present rate of expansion would have been 3 dash 10 three times as great. Had the initial expansion rate been 0.1% less, the universe would have expanded to only 3 times 10 in the power of the 6 of its present radiance before collapsing. And this maximum radius, the density of ordinary matter, would have been 10 to the 12 GRM dash M3 over 10 to the 16 times as great as the present mass density. No stars could have formed in such a universe, for it would not have existed long enough to form stars. R.H. Dickney, Gravitation of the Universe, 1969, page 62. Such an equation would have produced not a universe, but a whole. Roger L. Steve Peter in 1974 developed a complicated mathematical equation that showed that the theorized Big Bang could not have exploded outward into hydrogen and helium. In reality, St. Peter says that theoretical explosion, if, if one could possibly take place, would fall back on itself and make a theoretical black hole. This means that one imaginary object would swallow another one there. Nine, there is not enough antimatter in the universe. This is a big problem for the theorists. The original Big Bang would have produced equal amounts of positive matter and negative matter or antimatter. But only small amounts of antimatter exist. There should be as much antimatter as matter if the bang, Big Bang was true. Quote, since matter and antimatter are equivalent in all respects but that of electromagnetic, electromagnetic charge oppositeness, any force, the Big Bang, that would create one should have to create the other and the universe should be made of equal quantities each. This is a dilemma. 
Theory tells us there should be antimatter out there, and observation refuses to back it up. Isaac Asimov, uh, Asimov's News Guide to Science, page 343. We're pretty sure from our observations that the universe today contains matter, but very little, if any, antimatter. Victor Weisskopf of the Origin of the Universe, American Scientist, uh, 71, page 479. 10. The antimatter from the Big Bang would have destroyed all the regular matter. This fact is well known to phys physicists. As soon as the two are produced in the laboratory, they instantly come together and annihilate one another. We have mentioned ten reasons why matter would not be made by supposed Big Bang, but now we will discuss what would happen if it actually had. Number one, there is no way to unite the particles. As the particles rush angry from the central explosion, they would keep getting farther and farther apart from one another. Two, outer space is frictionless and there would be no way to slow the particles. The Big Bang is postulated on a totally empty space devoid of all matter, in which a single explosion fills it with outward flowing matter. There would be no way those particles would ever slow. Three, the particles would maintain the same vector speed and direction forever. Assuming the particles were moving outward through totally empty space, there is no way they would change direction. They could not get together and begin circling one another. 4. There is no way to slow the particles. They are travelling at supersonic speed and every kilometre would separate them farther from one another. 5. There is no way to change the direction of even one particle. They would keep racing on forever, never slowing, never changing direction. There is no way to get the particles to form into atoms or clusters into gaseous clouds. Angular momentum, turning motion, would be needed and the laws of physics could not produce it. 6. How could their atomic structures originate? Atoms, even hydrogen and helium, have complex structures. There is no way that outward shooting particles continually separated farther from each other as they travel could arrange themselves into atomic structures. We will now assume that contrary to physical laws, the particles magically did manage to move towards one another together, and the particles could slow down and change direction. The particles changed direction and formed gas clouds. The theory? Gradually, the outward racing particles are said to have begun circling one another, forming atoms. These atoms then changed direction further, this time towards another, and formed gas clouds, which then pushed together into stars. This aspect of the stellar evolution theory is as strange as that which preceded it. Gas molecules in outer space are widely separated by gas. We mean atoms of hydrogen or helium which are separated from one another. All gas in outer space has a density so rarefied that it is far less than the emptiness atmospheric vacuum pressure bottle in any laboratory in the world. Gas in outer space is rarer, less dense, atoms are more separated than anything on Earth too. Neither hydrogen nor helium in outer space would come together. In fact, there is no gas on Earth that comes together, e together. Either gas pushes apart, it does not push together. Separated atoms of hydrogen and helium would be less likely to come together in outer space. We will now assume that the outward moving, extremely fast, ever separating atoms shot out by the Big Bang explosion could slow, change direction and form themselves into immense clouds. Gas clouds push themselves into stars because gas, number one, because gas in outer space does not clump, the gas could not build enough mutual gravity to get together. And if it cannot clump together, it cannot form itself into stars. The idea of gas pushing itself together in outer space to form stars is more scienceless fiction. Fog, whether on Earth or in space, cannot push together into balls. Once together, a star maintains its gravity quite well. But there is no way for nature to produce one, getting it together in the first place is the problem. Gas floating in a vacuum cannot form itself into stars. Once a star exists, it will be absorbed gas into it by gravitational attraction. But before the star exists, gas will not push itself together and form a star or a planet or anything else, since both by hydrogen and helium are gases, they are good at spreading out but not at clumping together. Two. Careful analysis has revealed that there is not enough matter in gas clouds to produce stars. There would not be enough time for the gas to reach currently known expanse of the universe so it could form itself into stars. Evolutionists tell us 
was that the Big Bang occurred 10 billion years ago and stars were formed 5, 5 billion years later. They only allow about 2.5 billion years for it to clump together into stars. Their dating problem has been caused by the discovery of supposedly faraway quasars which we will discuss later, some of which are dated at 15 billion light years since they have a redshift of 400%. That would make them 15 billion years old which is too old to accommodate the theory. It doesn't take a nuclear scientist to figure out that the math in this paragraph, simple arithmetic will tell you there's not enough time. Four gas clouds in air to space expand, they do not contract. Yet they would have to contract to form anything. Any one of these points alone is enough to eliminate the stellar evolutionary theory. Five, if the Big Bang theory were true, instead of a universe of stars, there would only be an outer rim of fast moving matter. The outward flowing matter and gas clouds would keep moving towards without ever slowing in friction space, with no matter ahead of it to collide with. The supposed matter from initial explosion would keep moving onward, outward forever. This fact is as solid as the one mentioned earlier. 6. In order for the gas to produce stars, it would have to move in several directions. First, it would have to stop flowing outward, then it would have to begin moving in circles. Stellar origin theories generally require originating gas. Then the rotating gas would have to move closer together. But there would be nothing to induce these motions. The motions from the supposed Big Bang so just keep rushing outward forever. Linear motion would have to mysteriously change to angular momentum. A quantity of gas moving in the same direction as frictionless space is too stable to do anything but keep moving forward. Gas in outer space which was circling a common center would fly apart, not condensed together. There is not enough mass in the universe for the very theories of origin of matter stars. The total mean density of matter in the universe is about 100 times less than the amount required by the Big Bang theory. The universe has a low mean density. To put it in another way, there is not enough matter in the universe. This missing mass problem is a major hurdle not only to the Big Bang enthusiast but also to the expanding universe theorist. P. V. Rizzo, Review of Mysteries of the Universe, Sky and Telescope, August 1982, page 150. Astronomers are agreed on the existence of this problem. Hoyle, for example, says that without enough mass in the universe, it would not have been possible for gas to change into stars. He writes, quote, Attempts to explain, explain both the expansion of the universe and the condensation of galaxies must be largely contradictory so long as gravitation is the only force field under consideration. For if the expansive, expansive kinetic energy of matter is adequate to give of universal expansion as the gravitational field. It is adequate to prevent local condensation under gravity and vice versa. That is why essentially the formation of galaxies is passed over with little comment in most systems of cosmology. F. Hoyle T. Gold quoted in D.B. Larson Universe in Motion, 1984, page 8. Number 10. Hydrogen gas in outer space does not clump together. How its research disproves the possibility that hydrogen gas in the outer space can clump together. This is a major breakthrough in disproving the Big Bang and related origin of matter and stars theories. The problem is twofold. The density of matter in intercellular space is too low. Intercellular space is too low. There is nothing to attract the particles of matter in outer space to stick to one, to one another. Think about it a minute. Don't those facts make sense? This point is so important for it devastates the origin of stars theory that how its research should be mentioned in more detail. How its research dealt with the matter mathematical likelihood that high atoms could stick together and form tiny grains of several atoms by the random sticking of intercellular atoms and molecules to a single nucleus as they pass by at various speeds. Using the most favorable conditions and the maximum possible sticking ability for grains, how it determined that the amount of time needed for gas or other particles to clump together into a size of just a hundred thousandth of a uh, centimeter in radius would take about 3 billion years. Using more likely rates, 20 billion years would be required to produce one tiny grain of matter stuck together in mm -hmm. space. As with nearly all scientists quoted in our 1,326 page Evolution Disproved series, which this book is condensed for, from, Harwood is not a creationist. M. Harwood, Astro Astrophysical Concepts, 1973, page 394. 11. No 
Novelty's research findings are very important. Novelty, uh, Novotini, in a book published by Oxford University, discusses the problem of gaseous dispersion. It is a physical law that gas in a vacuum expands instead of contracts. Therefore, it cannot form itself into stars, planets, etc. That which cannot happen cannot happen given any amount of time. Do you agree? If you agree, you are being scientific, for you are agreeing with scientific facts. If you disagree, you are fooling yourself. We will now assume that clouds form themselves into what evolutionists call protostars or first generation stars. Stars exploding and supernovas producing heavy elements. The problem of the Big Bang only produced hydrogen and helium. Somehow the, the 90 heavier post helium elements had to be made. The theories had to figure out a way to account for their existence. The theory, the first stars which were formed, we so called first generation stars, also called population three stars. They contain only lighter elements, hydrogen and helium. Then all of these stars repeatedly exploded, billions upon billions of stars kept exploding for billions of years. Gradually, these explosions are said to have produced all our heavier elements. This concept is as wild as those preceding it. Another imaginative necessity, like all other aspects of this theory, this one is included in order to somehow get the heavier post-helium elements into the universe. The evolutionists admit that the Big Bang would only have produced hydrogen and helium. The nuclear gaps at mass 5 and 8 make it impossible for hydrogen or helium to change itself into any of the heavier elements. This is an extremely important point and is called the helium mass 4 gap. That is, there is a gap immediately after helium 4. Therefore, exploding stars could not produce the heavier e elements. Some scientists speculate that a lift might be produced, but even that would not be enough to supply all the heavy, heavy, heavier elements now in our universe. Among nucleides, nucleolides that can actually be formed, gaps exist at mass 5 and 8. Neither hydrogen nor helium can jump the gap at mass 5. This first gap is caused by the fact that neither a portion nor a neutron a proton nor a neutron can be attached to helium nucleus of mass. For because of this gap, the only element that hydrogen can normally change into hel is helium. Even, it span even if it spanned this gap, it would be stopped again at mass 8. Hydrogen bomb explosion produced deuterium or hydrogen 2, which in turn forms helium 4. In theory, the hydrogen bomb chain reaction of nuclear changes could continue changing into ever heavier elements until it reached uranium, but the process is stopped at the gap at mass 5. If it were not for that gap, our sun would be radiating uranium towards us. Quote, in the sequence of at um, atomic weight numbers 5 and 8 are vacant. That is, there is no stable atom of mass or mass 8. The question then is, how can the building up of elements by neutron capture get by these gaps? The process could not go beyond helium-4, and even if it spanned this gap, it would be stopped again at mass-8. This basic objection to Gamow's theory is a great disappointment in view of the promise and philosophical attractiveness of the idea. William A. Fowler, California Institute of Technology, quoted in Creation Science, page 90. Clarification, if you will look at any standard table of elements, you will find that the atomic weight of the th of Hydrogen is 1.008. Deuterium is a form of hydrogen with a weight of 2.016. Next come helium, 4.003, followed by lithium, 6,939. Beryllium, 9,000.012. Boron, 10,000.811, etc. Gaps in atomic weight exist at mass 5 and 8. But can that hydrogen explosion cross those gaps? No. Nuclear f fission and nuclear bomb are react to split unevenly halves. Uranium into barium and uh, tectantium nuclear fusion, a hydrogen bomb combines doubles or hydrogen into deuterium helium-2, which then doubles into helium-4 and stop there. So as hydrogen explosion, even in a star, does not go across the mass of five gaps we will now assume that hydrogen and helium explosions could go across the gaps at mass 5 and 8. 3. There has not been enough theoretical time to produce all the needed heavier elements that now exist. We know from spectrographs that heavier elements are found all over the universe. The first stars are said to have formed about 
250 million years after the initial Big Bang explosion. No one ever dates the Big Bang over 20 billion years ago, and the date has recently been lowered to 15 billion years ago. At some lengthy time after the gas collapsed into the first generation stars, most of them are theorized to have exploded and then 250 million years later reformed into second generation stars. These are said to have exploded into third generation stars, and our sun is supposed to be a second and third generation star. 4. There are no population 3 stars, also called first generation stars in the sky. According to the theory, there would be population 3 stars containing only hydrogen and helium, many of which exploded and made population 2 second generation stars, but there are only population 1 and 2 stars. Isaac Asimov, Asimov's New Guide to Science, 1984, page 35 and 36. Random explosions do not produce intricate orbits. The theory requires that countless billions of stars exploded. How haphazard explosions result in the, mar the marvelously intricate circlings that we find in the orbit of sun, stars, and binary stars, galaxies, and star clusters? Within each galactic system, hundreds of billions of stars are involved in these interrelated orbits. Were these careful balances not maintained, the planets would fall into the stars, and the stars would fall into the galactic centers, or, or they would fly apart. Over half of all the stars in the sky are in binary system, which two or more stars circling one another. How could such astonishing patterns be the result of explosions? Because there are no first generation population one stars, Big Bang Theory requires that evil, every star exploded at least one or two times, but random explosions never produce orbits. Six. There are not enough supernova explosions to produce the needed heavier elements. There are 81 stable elements and 90 natural elements. Each one has unusual properties in intricate orbits. When a star explodes, it is called a nova. When a large star explodes, it becomes extremely bright for a few weeks or months and is called a supernova. It is said that only the explosions of supernovas could produce much of the needful heavier elements, yet there have been relatively few such explosions. Throughout all recorded history, there have been almost no supernova explosions. If the explosions occurred in the past, they should be occurring now. Research astronomers tell us that one or two supernova explosions are seen every century, and only 16 have exploded in our galaxy in the past 2,000 years. Past civilizations carefully recorded each one. The Chinese observed one in AD 185 and another in AD 1006. The one in 1054 produced the Crab Nebula and was visible in broad daylight for weeks. It was recorded both in Europe and the Far East. Johannes Kepler wrote a book about the next one in 1604 and the next bright one was 1918 and the latest in the Veil Nebula in the large megalic cloud on February 24, 1987. Quote, supernovas are quite different and astronomers are eager to study their spectra in detail. The main difficulty is their rarity. About one per 650 years is the average for any one galaxy. The 1885 supernova of Andromeda was the closest to us in the last 350 years. Isaac Asimov, New Guide to Science, 1984, page 48. Number 8. Why did the Celia explosion mysteriously stop? The theory required that all stars exploded often. The observable facts are that throughout the recorded history, stars only rarely explode in order to explain this. Evolutionists postulate that 5 billion years ago, the explosion suddenly stopped. Very convenient. When the theory was formulated in the 1940s, throughout telescopes, astronomers could see stars whose light left them 5 billion years ago. But today we can see stars that are 15 billion light years away. Why are we not seeing massive numbers of stellar explosions far out in space? The stars are doing just fine. It's the theory which is wrong. Number nine. The most distant stars which are said to date nearly to the time of the Big Bang explosion are not exploding and yet they contain heavier elements. We can now see out in space to nearly the beginning of Big Bang time because of the Hubble telescope. We can now see almost as far out in space as the beginning of the evolutionist theoretical time. But as with nearby stars, the farthest ones have heavier elements, our second generation, and they are not exploding any more frequently than are the nearby ones. Number 10. Supernovas do not throw off enough matter to make additional stars. There are not many stellar explosions, and most of them are smaller star nova explosions, yet novas cast off very little matter. 
A small star exploding only loses 100,000 of its matter. A supernova explosion loses about 10%, yet even that amount is not sufficient to produce all the heavier elements found in the planets, instead gas and stars. So supernovas, gammas, fuel source for nearly all the elements in the universe, occur far too infrequently and produce far too small an amount of heavy elements to produce the vast amount that exists in the universe. 11. Only hydrogen and helium have been found in the outflowing gas from supernova explosions. The theory requires lots of supernova explosions in order to produce heavy elements. But there are not enough supernovas, and research indicates that they do not produce heavy elements. All that was was to turn a spectra up towards an exploded supernova and analyze the elements, and in the outflowing gas from the former star. Kate Davison did that in 1982, and found that the Crab Nebula resulting from an AD-11054 supernova only has hydrogen and helium. This means that regardless of the temperature of the explosion, the helium mass 4 gap was never bridged. It has been theorized that a supernova would generate temperatures high enough to bridge the gap, but the gap at mass 4 and 8 prevented it from occurring. 12. An explosion of a star would not produce an other, an, another star. It has been theorized that supernova explosions would cause nearby gas to compress and form itself into new stars, but if a star exploded it would only shoot outward and any gas encountered would be pushed along with it. So we find that the evidence does not support the various aspects of the Big Bang and Stellar Even theory. Number two, two, number two, more facts which bury the theory. More problems for stellar evolution. According to the theory, older stars should have m more heavy elements because they are continually making them. But the so-called older stars have been found to have no more heavy elements than the so-called younger stars. All stars from young to old have the same amount of heavenly elements. Second, the theory says that gas floating into cilia space is left over from the Big Bang and can only consist of hydrogen and helium. But Rubus has shown that this is not true. Extra ga galactic gas has a variety of heavier elements in it. Three, the theory says that superfast particles hurled outward by the Big Bang were eventually radiated. Yet the scientists have noted a perfectly smooth cosmic explosion would only have produced perfectly smooth, increasingly rarefied, ever farther apart particles. So the very existence of stars was the theory theorized original giga, uh, giant explosion. Four, the theory requires a continual rush of particles outward, leaving nothing inside this outer perimeter of outflowing matter. Yet there are stars and galaxies all through space not just at the outer edge, even if clunk gas could have formed any stars and everything could continue to be held to the chain, outer edges of space with an expanding center containing nothing. According to theory, the farther we look out into space, the farther back into past mm -hmm. eons of time, we are gazing. This means that the farthest stars and galaxies ought to be the youngest, yet research reveals the farthest stars are just like those nearby. Six, angular momentum is another serious problem. Why do stars turn? Why do galaxies rotate? Why do planets orbit stars? Why do binary stars circle one another? How could the superfast linear straight line motion started by the support of Big Bang have changed in rotation, spinning or revolving motion and revolutions orbiting motion? How could angular mo momentum exist and in such perfectly balanced orbits throughout space there is no possible way that floating gas could transform itself into rotating and observing orbiting objects like stars, planets and moons. Seven, inward pushing gas would not change to a rotating star. According to the theory, stars were formed by the inward gravitational collapse of hydrogen. Gas clouds, if so, why do the resultant stars rotate? Some stars rotate very fast. If ten people in a circle push marbles in towards a common center, the marbles would not begin rotating or circling after they reached it. Matter, origin and theories cannot explain why stars spin. The theories, theories tell us that the stars somehow started spinning, but with age they slow down, yet some stars spin faster than either younger or older stars. Some spin 
once in less than an Earth day. The fastest is 83 has a spin period of only six hours. Some stars orbit backward to that of other stars. The theorists can explain this. Ten, there are high velocity stars that are traveling far too fast to accommodate the evolutionary theories of matter and stellar origins. Eleven, if the Big Bang theories were true, all stars would move the same direction, but stars, clusters, and galaxies are moving in various directions opposite, opposite to one another. More about the expanding universe theory. Twelve, evidence is accumulating that the entire universe is rotating. This is angular momentum on the most gigantic proportions, yet the Big Bang should only have produced linear movements outward from it. Thirteen, theories are deeply bothered by what they call the lumpy problem. The universe is lumpy, that is, it has stars, planets, etc. in it, yet none should exist if the Big Bang theory were true. They argue fiercely over these problems in their professional journals while assuring the public the theory is accepted by all astrophysicists. They consider this to be a major unsolved problem. As IBM Phillips E. Seiden put it, the standard Big Bang model does not give rise to lumpiness. That model assumes the universe started out as a globally smooth, homogeneous, expanding gas. If you apply the law of physics to this model, you get a universe that is uniform, a cosmic vastness of evenly distributed atoms with no organization of any kind. No galaxies, no stars, no planets, no nothing, needless to say, the night sky dazzling in its lumps, clumps, and cluster says otherwise. How then did the lumps get there? No one can say. Ben Patrusky, Why is the Cosmos Lumpy? Science 81, June 1981, page 96. 14. The universe is full of stars with relatively little gas, but it should be the other way around, full of gas and not stars. The Big Bang should have produced a homogeneous universe of smooth gas, overflowing outward within at best almost inhomogeneities or lumps such as stars and our universe. 15. The universe is full of superclusters. These are the biggest lumps of all. It has recently been discovered that the galaxies are grouped into galaxy clusters and these into still larger superclusters. The big bang bangers, as their colleagues call them, execute, excuse the problem by saying that gravity waves produce the galaxies, but gravity in any form could not press floating hydrogen and helium into a star or planet out of gas make a marvelously organized disk network of stars or produce the precisely balanced spinning and orbiting of planets and stars. Quote, the main efforts of investigators have been preparing go over holes in the Big Bang theory to build up an idea that has become ever more complex and cumbersome. I have a little hesitation in saying that a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang theory. When a pattern of facts becomes set against a theory, experience shows that the theory rarely recovers so fresh. Hoyle, The Big Bang Theory, Attack, Science Digest, May 1984, page 84. 16. Solar collapse, not nuclear fusion, has been found to be the cause of the solar energy, but that would undercut the entire theory of the Big Bang. We will briefly summarize the data here. You will find it discussed more fully, along with the additional quotations in the chapter Origin of the Stars in the free volumes that set on our website. It is also particularly referred in six solar collapses in the Age of the Earth chapter. Earth chapter in this paperback. There is evidence that our sun shines not by hydrogen explosions but by solar collapse, yet stellar revolution is key to the fact that stars are fueled by shine because of hydrogen explosions, nuclear fusion. The amount of mass energy or sun would have to be lose daily amounts to 4 million tons, 3.6 million, etc. a second. The problem is the fusion process to produce lots of sub particles called neutrinos and each square inch of the Earth's surface should be hit each second by a trillion neutrinos. Scientists have neutrino detectors in place and have searched for them since the mid-1970s, but hardly any arrive from the Sun. This fact alone should appear to disprove the hydrogen theory of solar energy, J. A. Backel, Astronomical Journal 76-283-1971. Corliss, the world leader in tracking down scientific anomalies, considered the missing neutronos to be one of the most significant anomalies in astronomy. W.R. Corliss, Stars and Galaxy Cosmos, 1987, page 40. It was not until the 1930s that the nuclear theory of starlight was developed by Hans Beth and Carl von Weizsäcker. Yet it remains a theory. 
In contrast, there is strong evidence pointing to solar collapse as the true cause of solar energy. The scientific basis for solar collapse as the source of solar energy was developed over a century ago by two brilliant scientists, Hermann von Holmerson and Lord Kelvin. If each star is slowly contracting, great amounts of energy would be constantly released. But evolutionists cannot accept this possibility because it would mean the universe and the Earth is much younger. Nuclear fusion would mean billions of years for a star's life. Solar collapse only a few million. A change in the radius of our sun of about 80 feet 24.27 m. A year is all that would be necessary to produce our sun's actual energy release. This is a radius shrinkage of only not, uh, dot point, point not, not nine feet or 0.27 cm per hour. Some scientists have found evidence of solar collapse. One major study was done by John A. Eddy, uh, Aram Bernasian, new scientist, March 3, 1983 page 592. The basis for this is analysis of solar transient measurements made at the Royal Greenwich Observatory since 1836 and the US Naval Observatory since 1846. It was calculated that the Sun is shrinking at the rate of 5 feet an hour in diameter or 0.1 percent per century to acre second century. They also analyzed solar eclipses for the past four centuries and separated report by Ronald uh, Gillian, G Gilland confirmed the Eddy and Bernaysian report. The Sun has been contracting, quote, about 0.1 percent cent century, corresponded to shrinkage rate of about 15 feet per hour, 15.24 dm. GB Dublin Physics Today, Volume 32, Number 17, 1979. The above findings would indicate that our Sun output of radiant energy is generated by this shrinking, not by hydrogen explosions. Thermonuclear fusion deep within it, as already mentioned, if hydrogen was the so-called solar fuel, we should be receiving a very large quantity of neutrinos, yet almost none are detected. Jupiter is also apparently contracting because it is giving off more heat than it receives from the sun. A surface of contraction of just one centimeter per year would account for the measure heat from Jupiter. A similar situation exists for Saturn. Quote, Jupiter radiates twice as much energy as it absorbs from the Sun through contraction and cooling process. Star date radio broadcast number 8, 1990. Uh, Saturn emits 50% more heat than it absorbs from the Sun. Science Frontiers number 73, January, February 1991. These facts are known, but in order to defend evolutionary theory, the decision has been made to stick with solar fusion. Hydrogen explosions are the cause of solar energy and sunshine. Quote, astronomers were startled and laymen amazed when in 1979 Jack Eddy of the High Altitude Observ Observatory in Boulder, Colorado claimed that the sun was shrinking at such a rate that if the decline did not reverse our local star would disappear within a hundred million years. John Gribben, The Curious Case of the Shrinking Sun, New Scientist, March 3, 1983. Geolog geological evidence, however, indicates that terrestrial crust, our Earth's rock strata has an age of several billion years and it's surely to be expected that the Sun is at least as old as the Earth. We must conclude that another source must be responsible for most of the energy output of a star. Neva Novotini, Introduction to Stellar Atmosphere and Interiors, 1973, page 248. Summarizing solar collapse, the evidence that hydrogen explosion, thermonuclear fusion, is the cause of solar energy shine would be a great abundance of neutrino radiation but that evidence is missing the evidence that a solar collapse gradually shrinkage is the cause has been definitely found evolutionists reject solar collapse as the cause since it would mean our sun and the universe could not be more than a few million years old two the cosmology theories would be wrong and three the big bang theory would be gutted is there no evidence that supports the big bang theory evolutionists are able to point to two here they are. Number one, the background radiation, not evidence for the Big Bang. The fact there is a fair amount of heat radiation throughout the outer space is called background radiation. 
Since it comes uniformly from all directions, it is believed to exist throughout the universe. It is a very small amount of heat, in fact only 2.73 K above absolute zero or K, which is 20 C or 454 Fahrenheit. The theory of background radiation, or called, also called microwave radiation, first discovered in 1965, is said to be the single best evidence that the Big Bang occurred. It is said to be the leftover remains that the last remnant from the Big Bang explosion. Scientists said that the background radiation would prove the theory in four ways. Number one, it would come from only one direction, the Big Bang source. Two, it would have the right radical radiational strength to match the Big Bang mathematical theory. And three, it would emit the proper spectrum. Four, it would not be a smooth radiation. But we find that if this is the best evidence that the theorists can produce for their speculation, it is surely weak. Number one, it is Omnidirectional background radiations come from every direction instead of one. The Big Bang theory requires that it come from only one direction from where the Big Bang occurred. Since its discovery, science has been unable to match its directional radiation, its isotropy with the Big Bang predictions. Its omnidirectionality tells where the Big Bang radiation is coming from. Background radiation is actually a slight amount of heat given off by stars throughout the universe would they not be expected to emit a very faint amount of heat in outer space, into outer space too? The radiation does not fit the theory, for it is too weak. It would be far more powerful than it is. Fred Hoyle, the leading 20th century astrophysicist, said it should have been much stronger. 3. Background radiation lacks the proper spectrum. It does not have the ideal black body or total light absorption capacity which would agree with the Max Planck calculation. This radiation does not fit the theoretical 2.67 black, uh, K black body spectrum required for the Big Bang Theory. For the spectrum should be far hotter than it is. The heat emitted by the radiation should have a far higher temperature. The radiation should emit 1K black body radiation spectrum, which is far greater than the 2.73K spectrum now has. 5. Background radiation is too smooth. The theory requires that it be much more irregular and lumpy with density fluctuations. In order for it to explain how stars could be formed from the Big Bang explosion, in recent years some slight variations in smoothness have been detected, but this is still not enough to fit the theory. Quote, it seems difficult to believe that where is visible matter is conspicuously clumpy and clustered, and all scales the invisible intergalactic gas is uniform and ho homogeneous, J.D. Vuclius, the case for a hiero, hierarchical cosmology, Science 167, page 1203. The problem was to reconcile the apparent evenness of the early expansion as indicated by the steady background radiation within the large scale structures, stars, planets, etc. A perfectly smooth cosmic explosion would have produced only increasingly rarefied ever thinner gas cloud. Peter Pocock and Pat Daniels, Galaxies, 1988, page 117. 6. All of the above points, om uh, omnidirectionally, very slight amount of heat, generally smoothness with radiation fluctuations in strength is what we would expect from radiational heat from the multiple billions of stars throughout the universe. It would be understandable for all those stars to emit a slight amount of uniform omnidirectional radiative heat, and we would expect the radiational heat emitted by the star should at great distances show very slight fluctuation. Does not each one send forth heat and occasional gigantic solar flares? If you do not believe stars emit heat into space, then you do not believe the sun keeps you warm. Number two, the red shift not evidence for of the Big Bang or an expanding us. The fact relatively white light can be split by a triangular prism of glass into all the colors of the rainbow. Using a spectrometer, this can be done to starlight. Dark vertical bands mark the spectrum at various points. Analyzing these dark bands, the type of elements in each star can be ascertained and spectral type is a star classification based on its spectrum, surface temperature and mass. A spectrogram is a photograph of star spectrum. Spectros uh, spectroscopy is the study of spectra. Uh, ultraviolet is one end of the spectrum and has a higher frequency and shorter wavelength than visible blue light. Inferred is the other end of the visible spectrum, as astronomers call it red. 
Every star is redshifted to some extent, that is, the entire spectrum of that star is moved towards the red end. The farther a star or galaxy is from us, the more its light is shifted. This this displacement is called the red the theory the big bangers as scientists call then theorize that this redshift shows that the universe is expanding outward from the source of the big bang explosion they base this on the hypothesis that speed theory of the redshift is the only cause of the redshift this means that if light is traveling towards us the wavelength is slightly compressed or shortened this would cause the light to be blue shifted shifted towards the ultraviolet if it is moving away from us, the wavelength is stretched out, which causes a redshift shifted towards the inferred. Quote, this redshift observed in the spectral lines of distant galaxies, galaxies and interpreted as Doppler speed effect is the key to cosmology. Carl Sagan, Cosmos, page 252. What causes the redshift? Is it quite obvious that the distance of the star from us has something to do with the redshift? Here are four scientific explanations for the redshift each of which are accepted by various scientists. Number one, the speed redshift, so-called the Doppler theory of redshift. This would occur would occur if the star were moving away from us. Evolutionists say all the stars are moving away from us and that there is no other cause for the recorded redshift, but there are three other possibilities. Gravitational redshift. The pull of gravity on the light rays would cause a loss of energy in the beam of moving light. 1915, Albert Einstein predicted that gravity could bend light and that it would cause a redshift. This was later proved to be true. As light travels towards us from distant stars, it passes other stars which slightly, light slightly slow the beam, causing its spectrum to shift towards the red. Einstein's views of gravity led to the prediction that light emitted by a source possessing a very strong gravitational field should be displaced toward the red. The Einstein shift, Isaac Asimov, Asimov's New Guide to Science, 1984, page 50. Yet in order to bolster the Big Bang and expanding universe theories, even ignores gravitational sectioned order Doppler energy loss shifts. Second order Doppler shift, a light source moving uh, right angles to an absorb observer will always be redshifted. This would occur if the universe were moving slowly in a vast circle around a, a common center. We know that everybody in the universe is, is orbiting and at the same time moving in some direction with its orbital body. Much of that movement is at right angles to us. Next, energy loss shift. Light waves could themselves directly lose energy as they travel across long distances. This would nicely explain why the farthest stars from us have the most dramatic redshift. This is also called the tired light redshift. Big Bang theories maintain that the speed redshift is the only cause of the redshift because they can then say that the universe is expanding outward as a result of the Big Bang. But the evidence reveals that the speed redshift theory is the only cause of that the redshift is wrong. N next, nearly all the stars and galaxies are redshifted. This fact agrees with gravitational loss and second order Doppler and energy loss redshift. But if only the speed theory is accepted as the cause of this, nearly all the universe is moving away from us, our planet. A true expanding universe theory would mean that everything was moving outward from a common center somewhere, not from one planet. If the Big Bang really occurred, the universe would be rushing outward from where the explosion occurred, not from our planet. Example, a bomb explodes in our space, hurling shrapnel in every direction. A bomb explodes in outer space, hurling shrapnel in every direction. Some species would be fly pieces would be flying on in our direction, while others traveled in other directions. This differential could be measured. Some pieces would be flying towards us, others sideways and others away from us. If there was a Big Bang, we could date its origin by measuring redshift, but instead we only find evidence that everything in space is redshifted, that is, everything is supposedly moving away from us. This point disproves both the Big Bang and the expanding universe theory. Well, we'll leave it there, folks. and. Uh, we're on uh, page 98, and I uh, hope that's been of interest to you. I'm going to do the Gospels uh, by um, a very famous ancient scholar, well, not an ancient scholar, 19th century scholar called Tischendorf. He wrote a masterwork uh, defending the historical Gospels, so I'll be reading out that book later on this evening. 
and uh, I'll be also going on to Think Tank because he allows you to use his material and I'll be picking out one or two articles to do something intricate. Um, like I said, I'll um, see East operating on YouTube, uh, making these uh, quick videos. I'll be um, I will be doing Google Hangouts every now and again like this, just something um, that's got information that's helpful. And I will be making videos, but I'll be putting it on private and releasing them in a year's time. Uh, so that's what I'll be doing. Um, so I hope um, this has been a blessing to you. I hope it's been a challenge. And I hope uh, it encourages you to think through these issues. Thank you for listening and take care.